Hi, welcome to the Mattermost Dev Talk on React and Redux performance. I'm Harrison from the Mattermost team. So today's talk is going to be all about performance tips and things that we've learned to do and not do at Mattermost when we're trying to improve the performance of our apps. Uh, first off, I'm going to be talking about the more React side of things, particularly on reducing re-rendering of components. And then I'm going to be going, switching over and talking about Redux and things you can do there. So first off, just a quick summary of the React component lifecycle. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it because only a couple of these methods are actually really helpful for improving performance. However, I'm going to be talking about them in kind of most to least important order. First off, we're going to have should component update and then render and finally component will receive props. Just a quick note as well, um, component will receive props and a couple of the other methods are being deprecated in React and so they'll be removed at some point, presumably. Um, but at least component will receive props will be replaced by get derived state from props, which frankly fixes a lot of the issues you can have when implementing component will receive props poorly. Yep, so first off is should component update. Um, basically the main reason that should component update is incredibly useful for performance is that it controls whether or not a component will actually go through the process of rendering. Um, it takes in or it receives the next props and the next state that the component will have and you're able to compare them against the existing props and state to see if it should re-render. Um, by default, if you're extending react.component, it will always re-render, which is obviously not ideal. So generally if you're implementing should component update, you'll just be checking to see if any props or state of state has changed and if it has then it'll re-render. Um, you can see on the right kind of an example from an older component in our web app where we loop through every single prop, check it, we, well not loop, we go through every single prop and check it, every single state field to check it, which as you imagine gets really tedious and kind of annoying if you miss one and then your component doesn't re-render at the right time. Um, but thankfully there is react.pure component. So if you extend react.pure component, it gives you roughly the equivalent of should component update you can still implement the method yourself if you want, but it's not usually necessary. So what pure component does is it does a shallow equality check of all props and state fields, which is good except for it, it will cause issues if you're using objects or arrays or whatever for uh, props, which in that case, if they're not immutable, as we have with the data that comes from the Redux store, um, you'll have to manually manually do that check yourself. Um, and just an example here of something that can happen, which is if you're using peer component, you need to watch out for not mutating the prop or the state. Obviously with React, you're not supposed to mutate the state anyway, but it's very easy to do something like this and just not notice. In which case with a peer component, your component will not re-render at all. If you look at the bottom left, we mutate this dot state dot list by pushing a new item onto it and then put it back into the state. So technically there's no actual state change there and there it won't re-render. If you look or on the right, we make a new list instead. And so this dot set state does actually change the list. All right, so now on the render function, which is straightforward. Anyone who uses React should understand the render function. Um, since it gets run every single time that there is a state or props change, um, assuming should component update returns true, then some kind of things to avoid in it are you're going to want to avoid any really complicated work in there. Um, and particularly if you have a lot of different components and props and stuff going into it, you generally will want to start breaking up the components that it renders into kind of pieces. I'll give an example of that in a minute. Um, you should also note that whenever you or whenever your component renders, all of its children will also go through this whole render cycle. So you want to be sure not to change the props to them whenever possible, um, which sometimes ca can cause some issues if you're not paying really close attention to it. Uh, so first off, here's just a really simple example of what to do if you have an expensive render function. In this case, the markdown renderer um, is likely very heavy. And so every time you call render, it's redoing all this rendering, even if this dot props dot message doesn't necessarily change, which mean the HTML should stay the same. So in this case, 
to kind of solve it, you would move the HTML out into the state. And here we use component will receive props to check to see if the message changes. And then if it has changed, then we update the stored HTML in the state. Um, in, in the future, once component will receive props is deprecated, this is when you'd move it to get derived state from props. Um, here's another example. So this is for a component that's a list of some sort of item. There's a lot of work being done here. And the thing with this is that anytime any prop changes, the entire thing will re-render and it'll send a bunch of stuff out to React to actually convert into HTML. And particularly like if the title changes of this, you're re-rendering all the list items, you're re-rendering the search box stuff. It's all stuff that really shouldn't be necessary. So what you can do is break parts of these up into smaller or into separate components. So when in this example, say the title changes, the you're now telling it to render a new filter box and new list items. But because the props, those are the same, they won't re-render. Um, and it kind of saves a bit of work. And uh, all right, here's an example where it doesn't look like the props art would be changing. Like if you just call this render function repeatedly, it looks like it should kind of return the same thing. The thing is, and this is a kind of common issue that we run into, is that since it's an, we're using an anonymous function for the on click handler for the message button, it's actually passing in a new method or a new function into message button each time this renders, which will cause message button to re-render or re-render repeatedly as well. But in this case, it's pretty easy to solve. You just move it up to be a method. Uh, sometimes it gets to be a bit more difficult if you're trying to pass in arguments or anything, but in that case, you generally end up uh, refactoring it to make it its own component because then that component's method will be able to, or will, will always be consistent and be able to pass the arguments down as it needs. All right, next up is the component will receive props method. So component will receive props is run anytime the parent of a component re-renders that the child component will then call this and a, a couple other methods before it gets to should component update. So the big thing about this is that regardless of if props or state actually changes, this will always be called. So for example, if you have code like the uh, first example there, every single time the props may or may not have changed, it will be calling set state and changing the state, which will mean that it'll always re-render. In this sort of case, you, you do want to check whether or not like the uh, props have changed before you do that sort of step. It's similar to the markdown example we saw previously. All right, so that was it for React. Now we're getting to the Redux part of things. Um, if you're not familiar with Redux, it's a pattern slash library for kind of storing and displaying data. We're not going to focus on the whole library itself. There's We have another dev talk if you'd like to learn more about it, or you can follow the link through to um, their site. But the basic idea is we use the this connect function that you see here, plus a provided map state to prop function that we'll make on a kind of per function basis to wrap an existing component and pass in stuff as props from the store. So like in this in this case, we have a user list item component it needs a user, but this connected version only needs a user ID and then it'll properly pull down the user from the store and pass it in as a prop to the user list item. So there's some stuff you need to know about map state to props uh, is that map state to props gets run on every single store change. And if, if you're familiar to, if you're familiar with flux, that you have separate stores for different things so that there aren't a, always frequent store changes, but in Redux, you have one store. So anytime anything happens anywhere throughout the app, like in Mattermost, say a user starts typing or, or reacts with emoji or sends a message or something, every single component with a map state to props will have that map state to props called. Um, it, that sounds horribly inefficient and it certainly can be if you haven't implemented it right. But as long as you're smart with what you're doing, it shouldn't be much of an issue. Um, it, you'll run into a lot of similar problems to like in component will receive props or uh, render where it's just doing expensive work or passing in new props each time. Um, you, here you can see the example where we're creating or we're concatenating a some sort of placeholder onto the end of this list. 
and then passing it in as a prop to the my list component. Um, that's bad because obviously in the first example, you're creating a new list every single time the store changes, and then you, that means you're passing in new props every single time the store changes, and we're re-rendering every single time the store changes, which is a lot. Um, to improve this, you generally would do something like this within the actual component itself. So as long as the list that's grabbed from the store does not change, then the component won't re-render and you'll be doing good there. Thankfully, we do have a method of improving this um, using, a, this is a library called reselect and it provides these, the idea of selector functions, which basically they're just pure functions, kind of work as helper functions almost for deriving data from the store. The way that they're kind of constructed, you can see here with the get current user one in particular, or is it kind of a good example, is there are any number of um, kind of argument functions, I'll call them. In this case, for, for get current user, they'd be get current user ID and get all users. The results of these functions are passed down into the final result function there, which is just an anonymous function. And basically the way they work is as long as the, as long as the um, values returned from the argument functions don't change, then it won't rerun that result function and it'll just return the previous value. So this example is kind of contrived because all this computation is really simple, but basically it skips do redoing that result function if the previous functions don't change. So they won't be recalculated in this case if like the current user ID or all or none of the users change. This gets to be really useful again when you get kind of actual computation going on. Um, again, that get current user full name function is not particularly complicated, but with the way that works, it will only recalculate whatever the user's full name is if that user changes. If you have like someone send posts or someone clicks a checkbox or whatever somewhere else in the Redux store, it will still just return the same thing it had previously. Um, if you want to know more about selectors, by the way, I did a previous dev talk where I kind of go in a bit more depth on it. Might be a bit out of date at this point, but hopefully it shouldn't be relevant still. Now, something to understand with selectors is that you're going to want to kind of break up the selector itself to avoid passing the unnecessary state around. Um, in this first example, you can see kind of a different version of the same function from the last page where it just passes in the current user ID and all users into this function, which that means it recalculates what the full name of the current user is anytime any user changes. Um, if Again, if you go back to kind of the version that we had on the previous slide, it will only recalculate if the current user itself changes. Now, this is a more extreme example, but I see it comp occasionally when we have particularly like more complex selectors. Um, the, eventually you might get really kind of frustrated when you're trying to break up and figure out how to organize your selectors. And at some point you will just say that, okay, I'm just gonna pass state into the result function. Now that is really bad because pretty much any single time, well, actually yeah, every single time the state changes, it will recalculate. Basically, it's actually worse than just not even using a selector in the first place because it's also having to do any sort of computation to see like, okay, has the state changed? Has all users changed? Has current user changed? When with the way this is written, we know it's true pretty much, unless you're calling this repeatedly without a state change, in which case it's, I guess, slightly better, but in the long run, it's just not good. Don't, don't do this. So generally it's just, you have to be a bit smarter, again, just pick and choose what parts of the store you need. In this case, it's fairly obvious that we need state.config.showCurrentUser and the state.preferences.sort backwards. So instead of passing state all the way down and doing that in the actual result function, you can see here, we just kind of make a couple more argument functions that they're anonymous functions and they're just plain old functions, but they kind of serve the same purpose as a selector where they will just return simple values and then we can compare those simple values to see if they've changed. And then in that case, like as long as the config value and the preferences value doesn't change and the all users and current user, then it won't recalculate repeatedly. 
Um, one other thing that selectors can also have parameters, which is something we do fairly frequently um, because it kind of it's, it's useful in many cases. Now, as long as you pass different arguments into a selector, it will recalculate, kind of kind of the same as if state changed. But the problem that this has is, say you have or you're using a selector in multiple places and passing in different arguments, that means that it's basically not memoized and it is constantly recalculating. Again, this gets user selectors kind of contrived because it's really simple anyway. But it will always, rec or if, if say it, in this example, you have a user list item and that gets the user and passes it in like the previous one I mentioned. Um, but because we're, we're gonna have multiple user list item components, it's gonna be calling get user with different user IDs repeatedly. And so again, it'll be recalculating. So the proper way to fix this is to instead of having like a get user selector, you will make like a make get user kind of factory function and that will return an instance of the selector. In this case, then you have each user list item get its own instance of a get user selector. And so then as, as long as the user ID passed into a specific user list item does not change, then it'll always just use the memoized version and it will not recalculate repeatedly. So yeah, and kind of summary of the things that you can do to kind of improve performance. You're going to want to make sure that every single React component you use has, is either a pure component or use a should component update. Um, you'll want to take a look at the render method and kind of avoid unnecessary work and also break it up when you have just a very large complex component. Um, you'll want to make sure that you're not accidentally changing props in the render method. Uh, that's a big thing to do. And you'll want to remember that component receive props is called in every single props change. So again, you'll want to keep it very simple. Similarly, map state to props, you'll also want to keep as simple as possible because again, it's being called repeatedly. Um, and if you are having to do computations there, use a selector so that it doesn't recalculate. And then, yeah, in terms of selectors, you want to keep them simple and break them up when necessary. So avoiding recalculation as much as possible. And if you're going to have parameters on the selector, you're going to want to make sure it has like a, some sort of factory function so that you can have multiple instances of it without them kind of paving over the results of each other. So yeah, that's the Mattermost dev talk on React and React performance. Um, feel free to join us if you want to discuss this or anything else on prerelease.mattermost.com. It's our community server slash kind of our, our personal server that we work on every day and there's almost always someone around at this point. Um, you have a bunch of different channels you can join to be involved in different conversations or just watch or say hi or whatever you want to do. So yeah, feel free to join us there. See you later.